Consumers want to know the facts about the products they buy, but America's agricultural landscape is not easy to navigate. Between different companies, scientific advancement, government regulations, advertisement campaigns, and an unhealthy amount of myth and misconception, anyone would be hard-pressed to make sense of it. That's where Real Ag comes in, from the producers who make your food, to the store where you buy the final product, and everything in between. This is Real Ag. Now, here's your host, Kyle Bauer. Kansas is known as the wheat state, but did you know corn was the highest value crop grown in the state? Kansas corn acres have doubled since the mid-1990s, and 98% of all corn farms are family farms. Corn is the topic today on Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible by the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by farmers. Corn is a uh, to grass species plant, so um, it's a monocot, so it's a, it's a derives from a, um, the grass species um, naturally found. It actually originated in Central Americas, and. Um, with the Indians. So obviously it's referred to as maize across the globe, as a lot of people refer to it, but teosinte is one of the earliest known um, corn species that relates back to it and looks absolutely nothing like the corn that we're used to today where it produces an ear. Actually produced a grain on top of the plant. Um, but uh, So it's native here to the Americas, more to the central part of the Americas. Corn nutritionally is kind of a, is a fiber source. Obviously, there's a lot of vitamins and amino acids that are uh, essential to human consumption, but really more of a starch type product, um, and really is more widely used in in animal feed stuffs than probably than for human consumption. Well, corn is is a is a feed source for livestock primarily. You know, the the type of corn we raise. So so it provides the starch, the carbohydrates necessary to feed cattle, hogs, and swine, and also the starch that's used in uh, ethanol production. How does the farmer determine what kind of corn to plant? The seed distribution system mainly comes from from three or four seed providers and we make the decisions of, of what type of corn to plant based on in our area. We're all the dry land producing area here. So we, we look at traits like drought tolerance, we look at the need for biotechnology, whether we need corn borer protection or rootworm protection, whether we're on a very high yielding environment or whether we're on very poor soils that need, need a type of hybrid corn that's very tough and drought resistant. Most cattle feeders will begin with a, a very light ration of corn early when the calves are weaned along with, with hay or silage or, or supplemental uh, feeds like that and then gradually increase the amount of corn as the cattle grow and uh, get it closer to uh, slaughter weights. Why is corn important to the United States? Well, corn is, is huge for the United States because there's a lot of livestock fed in the U.S. Uh, the livestock need, need grain to produce quality meat, and, and corn is the primary grain that's, that's fed to livestock. So, so we all know the bushels that are produced in the U.S., it's, it's the number one grain crop in the U.S., and there's a, just a huge volume of corn that's consumed that way. Exports vary. A lot of it depends on price. Right now, with, uh, with the depressed grain prices, we're setting records for, for corn exports. So, so that is a huge, uh, uh, huge contributor to the price of our corn here in the U.S. From a, the producer standpoint of view, most people are, are just handling it to, to, the, to an elevator or to a terminal. And then from there, the, the buyers of those are, are purchasing from those terminals, typically, or those elevators to then ship beyond. Um, typically, on, a, on the side of corn, you're not directly shipping to, to the end, end consumer at that point. From a corn producer standpoint of view, the National Corn Growers Association readily um, is there lobbying for corn producers, uh, corn farmers across, across the United States. So they typically are in, in contact with legislators. I mean, you can contact your local legislators as well. But on beyond that, um, they're there lobbying every day for corn producers and corn, pro um, corn products. Um, on a daily basis. 
So the economic impact's huge. I mean, when you start looking at the consumption by animals, is, is widely the biggest part of why corn uh, is used in the United States. Um, the production of meat is, is a staple for, for most diets in, in the United States, but as we export beef across the world, um, corn is, is highly important on producing a, that meat. Corn is produced in other countries as well as the U.S. Recently, Terry Venduska visited China to see their production. The region of China we visited was, uh, was the northern part of their corn and soybean belt, about the same latitude as northern South Dakota. Uh, beautiful deep soils, very good corn and soybean uh, producing area. They're probably, the farms we visited were fairly large farms. They're probably five to ten years behind us in technology. They're beginning to use uh, GPS technology and guidance systems and, and things like that. But they have absolutely no conservation practices at all, so there are serious erosion problems. Uh, they use no biotechnology at all. The government prohibits any biotech traits. So they're basically using uh, hybrids that we used many years ago before the introduction of biotechnology. What is biotechnology and how does it benefit the farmer? The first biotech trait we uh, began using here was uh, resistance to, was herbicide resistance, primarily uh, Roundup or now uh, the generic glyphosate. And that allowed us to use a, use a chemical that, uh, a herbicide on our corn that we normally couldn't use because without that trait, uh, Roundup will kill corn. Because of that trait, it's resistant to that. So we can use a herbicide that kills, at least when it was introduced, killed virtually everything growing out there except the corn or except the soybeans. So that allowed us to have much better weed control than we ever could in the past. It allowed us to move to more uh, no tillage practices or conservation tillage where we didn't have to till the soil as much. We could uh, maintain soil structure, we could maintain soil moisture and get much better weed control because we were using that uh, biotech trait of herbicide resistance. Eventually, biotechnology grew to where we've got resistance now to corn borer, uh, also resistance to rootworm. And we can use one or all of those traits as needed in our farm to protect the crop against those various pests without having to spray, at least for corn borer and rootworm, without having to spray uh, toxic chemicals, uh, insecticides, to kill those pests. Our farm is 100% is, uh, no-till. Except maybe where we run some cattle, we might have to do a little bit of light tillage where the cattle pasture uh, through the winter. But because of our no-till rotation, the biotechnology is huge to allow that rotation to allow us to move from one crop to the other without tillage and still get good weed control. And we don't have to worry about insect pests because of the resistance to corn borer. We hear a lot about ethanol. What is it? and how is corn utilized in its production? Ethanol is, ethyl alcohol is just a common name used for, for uh, ethanol, but it's the same alcohol that we typically drink in our adult beverages or, or whatever, you, you know. And, but it's a fermentation process that happens. So it doesn't have to be directly corn, it's starch. So it's a fermentation of starch. So it can be a biomass product, but corn is most commonly known um, and most publicized for, for, the, for the production of ethanol. Ethanol is, is, a, uh, is a fuel source, a fuel supplement that's used to provide octane uh, to our gasoline fuels. Uh, all, uh, virtually all U.S. gasoline right now is at least 10% ethanol. So it's an opportunity to provide uh, cleaner fuel, to provide less pollution, and uh, equal or better engine performance with the introduction of ethanol. Ethanol is produced from primarily from grain, corn, or grain sorghum. Uh, there's also some production that's coming in from, from cellulosic products, but it's produced in, in, a, in a plant that utilizes the starch from that grain to produce ethanol. The remaining uh, product that's left after the starch is pulled out of the corn or the grain sorghum is, uh, is used to produce a product called distiller's dried grains. Uh, some of that is dried into a, a dry compound, some of it is, is actually fed wet, and it's an incredible protein source for livestock. And early on when ethanol production began, interestingly, people were afraid they'd almost have to give DDGs away, that there just wouldn't be much value for, for that 
uh, products. So they didn't factor that value in when they looked at the profitability of ethanol plants. But as, as cattle feeders primarily, and then somewhat the poultry and a little bit of swine began to realize the value of DDGs, they are now a very, very high value product. So, so it, they, it's been a great revenue stream for the ethanol plants. Ethanol's uh, advantages is that it's a renewable fuel. Um, you know, it, it releases us from our dependence on petroleum, but also on foreign oil, which in 2007 became a big part of, of America and what we were trying to do. Um, the fact that we were so reliant on foreign oil in the Middle East and those things. So this allows us to be less dependent on, on those, but it's a, natu it's a natural occurring product that we can renew every year. So there was the mandate, right, the 2007 mandate of, of how ethanol was going to be used in the blends and, and, and it was mandated that certain percent of, of ethanol was put in. Um, that mandate's gone. <clears throat> it, was good for, it was good for producers, it was good for rural economies, um, it was good for the American consumer for the, allowed us to get away from that um, demand on foreign oil. Most, most gasoline has ethanol in it, whether it's mandated or not, um, it's used uh, in most blends. And how it's used is different according to each region. And some are labeled, some are not. So up to a certain percent, the consumer will know whether or not it should be. Um, whether or not it should be used, um, I guess that's up for that's a very that's a debatable question whether or not a person should be forced into using it or not. Um, but uh, it's it's good for the environment. It, it cleans. It, it burns clean. Um, it burns cleaner than our regular gasoline will burn. Uh, it burns at a different point, so it's a higher viscosity, and so that makes a big difference in. Um, the environment and the way that gasoline is burned. Yeah, I think from, from a producer standpoint, it helps my bottom line. It, it increases the price of corn and that, that makes me really happy. Uh, my livestock friends love DDGs. They're able to alter their rations significantly from, from how they used to feed cattle to how they feed them now because of, because of DDGs. Uh, a lot of DDGs are also exported. We, we talked about exporting whole corn before, and, and DDGs are, are a huge export commodity right now throughout the world. For, for corn, Japan obviously is our number one uh, exporting country. A lot of it also goes into Mexico. There's 20-some uh, countries around the world that, that are bringing in U.S. corn. Uh, DDGs, a lot of it goes into Southeast Asia. A lot of DDGs are consumed through the, uh, the fish industry as a protein source. Uh, a lot of DDGs are consumed in, in, in many countries as a supplement to, uh, to their livestock ration, possibly replacing some soybean meal with, with DDGs. Very little Kansas corn is exported. Most of our corn here is, is fed to the livestock industry right here in, in Kansas. But uh, over 20 years ago, I, the reason I got so involved in the U.S. Grains Council and export, over 20 years ago, I. I was raising a fairly short season corn. So I was the first producer to haul new crop corn to our local elevator. The manager was on vacation. And when I brought the corn in, uh, the assistant manager didn't know how to price that corn. So he called the manager, he says, Terry brought some corn in, what's new crop corn worth? And he said, well, it's simple. It's uh, Nebraska corn plus freight. And that's what you're paying. So the light went on in my head thinking, I don't want Nebraska corn competing with my corn. I don't want Iowa corn, Illinois corn competing with my corn. I was involved in the Kansas Corn Commission at that time and we, we did a little work with the U.S. Grains Council, but not very much. But as we began to, to, to look at the advantages of exports, we realized that we need corn disappearance, whether it's through livestock or whether it's through export. And if we can move more corn from the Corn Belt, through the export market, whether it's down the Mississippi River or out the Pacific Northwest by rail, we need that corn to disappear because that adds to my bottom line. And, and that's where most of the corn will, will be exported, is either out of Pacific Northwest from north, north central U.S. or down the Mississippi and, and out the Gulf region. There have been some concerns about feeding corn to cattle. What is your opinion? I think a lot of those concerns are based on, on a, a point of view that I would say is not, is not science-based. 
it's uh, it's rumor, it's hearsay, it's someone's uh, wild idea that that corn is bad, and I I counter that with. With true science, every argument that I've ever heard or seen or read that talks about the dangers of, of feeding corn, you can counter with multiple scientific research projects that prove corn is very, very safe. It's, uh, without a doubt, the most economical feed source for our livestock. So how are you going to feed livestock if you don't have, if you don't have corn or if you don't have grain sorghum? Well, I think a lot of it is the misconception around GMOs and the way GMOs uh, affect humans and affect um, everybody that's out there. You know, I think the, the misinformation about GMOs is what most people need to really study for themselves, so to speak. There's a lot of misinformation out there about GMOs. And, um, but to know that GMOs are there to make a better product, to make a, a better environment, cleaner, safer, health, healthier foods. Um, and I think the way that I, I always view it, from a producer standpoint of view, um, we, have, you know, we have children as well. And if it wasn't safe for our families and our children, we wouldn't feed it to them. And we're feeding the exact same stuff, the, the same food sources that the average consumer is. And if I didn't feel it was safe for my children, I wouldn't give it to them. So um, I think the misconception around um, GMOs is, is a big one. I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of audiences about, about GMOs, and I, I stress that when I first began talking about that, I use the term enhanced. I talk about genetically enhanced corn or genetically enhanced soybeans, because that's really what we've done. We've taken what happens in nature Nature's been evolving forever, and we always have grains that have been changing naturally. And all we've done through genetic enhancement or through genetic modification is speed up the process and maybe encourage the process to go into a specific direction. We wouldn't have herbicide resistance without genetic modification. We wouldn't have corn borer resistance or rootworm resistance without that. For me as a farmer, it goes back to my bottom line. Uh, because of the herbicide resistance, because of the insect resistance, the corn borer resistance primarily is a trait we need. It allows me to have protection to that, uh, to those insects that I would only get through chemical sprays, which is very, very costly. So I can bring that resistance in with the seed and I don't have to worry about ever having to spray for corn borer. And, and that's, that's huge to me. It helps, it, uh, it's, much, it's much less expensive using uh, that biotech trait. It's much better for the environment because I'm not having to spray toxic chemicals on the top of my corn. 90% of the corn acres in the United States roughly are, are GMOs. And uh, you could get into the debate about what a GMO really is. You could say that wheat technically is a, is a, is a GMO. Um, it's two different grass species that were man-made to get, make wheat as we know it today to make bread. So um, corn, in a sense, is always genetically modified. Um, so the, the debate of genetically modified versus genetically engineered, um, how you want to look at it. But GMO is a very, it's an unsettling term for a lot of people. Basically what they've done is they've taken a characteristic or a gene that uh, the corn plant that they want to insert into the corn plant, and so they go into the uh, to the DNA of the corn plant, which they have mapped out, and they insert that gene cleanly into a certain spot on that plant. So um, it's a lot different today than what it was. I mean, when we first started, they were basically taking germplasm, they were taking um, birdshot type, and, and they were blasting it into the endosperm of the corn or the soybean or whatever plant that was. And it was kind of a dirty, messy way, and they had markers, and that's where they would, once that plant expressed that marker, they would say, this carried the trait that we're looking for. Um, today, it's much cleaner, right? They're taking the exact trait that they want, placing it onto the DNA chain, right where they want it, into the DNA of the corn plant, and that way it's much cleaner and uh, more effective in the, in the breeding. They've, they've found, uh, through the, the DNA strands, they found the link that controls, say, insect resistance in corn. So they're able to insert a genetic trait from another plant that's resistant to that insect that you want control of into the DNA strand of that of corn to allow the corn then to naturally have that resistance. So it's it's a very natural process 
We're just manipulating how it happens a little bit. It's not like we're inserting anything weird into corn. We're just taking something that naturally occurs in another plant and inserting it into corn to allow that, that corn plant to have resistance. And again, we don't have to spray with chemicals. So that's the advantage. It's much, much safer. Everything that when it comes to GMOs is always um, has to be approved by not only our government, but the governments across the world, and which is a big hang up in the things that we're seeing today. Obviously, there's uh, the 2013 piece where um, uh, Syngenta had Viptera corn that was found and stuff that was exported to China. Um, that didn't meet their approval. So we've seen the ramifications of that based on the fact that it's completely political, has nothing to do with, with, uh, with science or factual based information, but it's a completely political thing that's happened. That's the same trait is being produced in South America, can be, can be shipped to China, can be done from the United States. It's completely political. Japan tends to uh, approve uh, GMO traits very quickly. Uh, some countries take a year or two. Uh, in China's case, they haven't approved anything. And, and one of the reasons we were there is to visit with their farmers about the advantages of biotechnology. Because we believe if the Chinese farmers start requesting that trade, saying we, we need that, it will make us more money, then the government has no choice but to allow uh, GMO imports because they'll approve it for production right in, in China. So China's a very, uh, it's a very unique market. They're very, they, they do things their own way, and you just never know what they're going to do. They could change their minds in a heartbeat and op open up and say, GMOs are good. Who knows? Because it's all government controlled there. There's, there's reports that, ha that, that the seed companies have to turn in to, to the EPA and various government agencies to monitor the safety of those. Uh, they're always watching to ensure that that crop will be safe that will perform properly, that there's absolutely no harmful, harmful uh, uh, effects to the environment or to the consumer in any way or shape or form. It's, nothing has been more widely watched and monitored than genetically modified crops. Just a, there's a lot of information that's been put out in the media. Of course, the media has changed the world in the way we know it. Everybody knows that. So anybody can say anything, put it on social media and broadcast it and then because somebody said it it becomes gospel so to speak um, it, and it doesn't have to be factual and I think that's a lot of the, the trouble with the American consumer in general is we have so much information thrown at us and being able to sort through what's credible and factual and what's not is hard in a lot of times um, so much of it's politically driven um, and like I said a lot of it's not factual based so the misconception about GMOs, um, the fact that people are engineering or genetic, genetically modifying, whether it's, it's, it happens in animals as well, um, is very uh, uneasy with some people. And so they'll spout anything to put fear. So there's this fear that, that drives most people. And when we, when we can scare people about what it is they're consuming and cr create a bit of doubt, then we start to question it. And uh, so when we see that with GMOs, you know, is it safe? Is it healthy? I mean, it kills insects. Is it healthy for my body? That becomes a real question. And uh, you have to look back to science. And when you have over at 100 of, 100 of the most uh, acclaimed scientists in the world, 88% of those scientists say that it's safe. And there's 11% that question it. Um, that leaves you, what, 1% left that says it's not. I mean, to say, that it's science-based and it's, it's healthy, you just let the numbers speak for themselves. We need markets, and, and the more markets we have for our corn, uh, for our soybeans, the, the more profit we make. So, so the more countries that open up to what we're raising, the better, better it'll be for all of us. And the cheaper the food will be for the U.S. consumer, because the more markets we have, the better opportunity to have lower cost food. So it, it benefits everyone. I'm a grandfather, and there's no one on earth I love more than my two grandchildren. If I had any reason to think GMO food, GMO grain was not safe, would I ever allow them to eat the corn that we raise in our fields? Absolutely not. Even though it's not sweet corn, we still eat, eat the corn fresh. I've eaten it all my life. My daughters have eaten it. My grandchildren eat it. We love it. We would 
I would never ever allow them to consume that if I had any inkling that it would be dangerous. And it's never ever been proven to be dangerous. I mean, there's nothing in the history of the U.S. that's ever been tested as much as GMO grain. And I have yet to see a scientific study that proves it's dangerous in any way. We hope today's program has given you some good information about corn. That wraps up this episode of Real Ag. Remember, you can see every program of this series by going to SmokyHillsTV.org. On behalf of the Real Ag crew, I'm Kyle Bauer, and this has been Real Ag. Production of Real Ag is made possible by the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by farmers.